this session ran as a hugely successful workshop in Melbourne last year, and we just thought it'd be a great idea to share these ideas with you today um, in a webinar format around Australia. We have four presenters with us today. We have Richard Oliver, Sarah Evans, Lucy Price, and Mark Rooney, who will be presenting this webinar. The webinar will run in three sections. The first section will look at fun and movement and clear objectives in the EAP classroom and why these are so essential. The second section with Sarah and Lucy will look at students having freedom over their language production and having more interaction and creativity in the classroom. And what are the constraints to creativity in the EAP classroom? Mark's section will look at reading skills in the EAP class. And I think we should now get started with Richard. So Richard, Hi, I'll, everyone. Just hand over, I'll just hand over the controls to you now. OK. OK, Richard. Hi, everyone. My name is Richard Oliver. And I've come to EAP teaching from a general English background. And one of the things I found when I first started teaching EAP was that because the skills are more in depth, sometimes the classroom could be a little bit stagnant or we could be a little bit demotivated. So this presentation that I'm giving today is just talking about how we can use movement and clear objectives and understanding the learners' needs about higher education to create a um, a classroom that's got a little bit more zing and zip in it in the EAP classroom. So um, that's what I'm going to be talking about. And the depth of skills that are necessary at EAP level can often lead learners to feel like they're just kind of sitting there and absorbing knowledge. And sometimes they don't um, remember some of it because they leave the classroom and um, they're maybe not. Um, as engaged in the classroom as we'd like. So first of all, I thought I'd talk about why EAP should be fun. Yeah, my slides just skipped on, but that's okay. Um, so EAP probably should be fun because we've got to make a nice clear link to higher education for the students. And students often think that it's got to be serious because it's EAP. It's got to be serious because higher education is going to be serious. And I think that we kind of need to just kind of break that link a little bit with them and point out that still we can have a lot of fun. So the five areas that I'm going to talk about today are clear objectives, movement, vocabulary, the needs of the student, and the last thing I'm going to talk about is the element of surprise, which is something that I love. So first of all, clear objectives. Clear objectives are really important, I think, in all classrooms, of course, because learners need to know why. But in the EAP classroom, I think this means that we need to have a very clear link to the students' higher education studies so that they can see that they're coming. In Australia, it's quite common that we have people coming into our classrooms in EAP who just see EAP as being a hurdle to the higher education. Maybe they didn't get quite a high enough IELTS score or a Pearson score to get into their course, and they just can some of them be a little bit frustrated with that? So um, if we motivate them and have a, um, a fun classroom that has a clear link to their higher education course, then we can have fun, even though it's a serious kind of fun, and we can have motivation in there and a higher participation rate overall. So um, those things are probably the most important things, I think, about clear objectives. Moving on now to talk about um, movement a little. So movement in the classroom is also an important area. Um, uh, first of all, before I do that, let's talk quickly about student thoughts on class fun. So sometimes students don't understand why we're having fun, though. So if we don't have objectives in the classroom, we can have these things in blue on the left-hand side of your screen uh, where the students feel that the class is just frivolous or we're wasting their time and that the teacher isn't serious. 
Whereas when we have objectives along with the games or the activities that we're going to bring into the EAP classroom, then we can show students that we're aiding their memory, we're helping their learning, that we're um, building up a good class dynamic using teamwork and team skills. Okay, now let's move on and talk a little bit about movement. So, um, one of the things that is so important in a classroom to get motivation levels high is movement and in the AP classroom just like in the general English classroom we've got the option to have pair work, whole class work, excursions um, and again we can link these to the kind of activities that students are going to be doing in university so excursions particularly are a very useful way to sort of get outside of the classroom and talk to students about what they're going to be doing on their next course and show them what's on the campus if we're linked to a campus. Here I wanted to talk about um, the different possible groups of two in this classroom. So here we've got eight learners, Elliot, Selma, Michael, Jacob, Sally, Annalise, Quan and Madeleine. And I just wanted to ask here a question to the audience, Aparna, and see if people in the audience could answer. Um, and what I was focusing on here was sometimes I feel like I don't move my students around enough. So um, I was thinking the other day about how many possible groups I have in the classroom and I was surprised by the answer to this question. So if I have eight students in my classroom, how many possible pairings do the audience think I have? Can anyone audience, answer? Please type in your answers. Um, Mark's question is, how many possible pairings uh, can you see with this group of eight? Oh, ten? Is it ten? Eight. 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 Please type in your answers. So, Mark, we have a couple of answers here. We have oh, what do you 28. Have? Oh, that's... A very good answer, yeah, that, that's that correct. That's a good answer, thanks. <laughs> um, so 28 is correct, yeah, so to do this kind of um, probability, uh, it's funny getting English teachers to do probability, but um, here we've got 8 times 7 in this case because we've got 8 students and then each student can work with another student in the classroom, so that gives us 56 in this case but obviously you can't work with yourself if you're in a pair. And then of course, if um, Quan is working with Annalise, Annalise is also working with Quan, so we divide by two. So all I'm really showing here is that there's a lot more possibility in pairing than we tend to think of. And although we might not be able to use 28 pairs in one lesson, we can use them over the time period of you know maybe a few lessons with the same group of students. So um, as well as, um, movement in the classroom. Today I'm also going to talk a little bit about um, movement in the whole class. So here there's an activity that I like to do with students and this was designed to um, talk about uh, opinion essays and argument essays with students because I was finding that I had a lot of trouble, as I think we all do, with getting my students to pick a position and to justify it. So this is an activity where you write different things on the walls of the classroom. So here we've got strongly agree with capital punishment at the top and strongly disagree with capital punishment at the bottom. And these are opposite walls of the classroom. And miscarriage of justice is rare and miscarriage of justice is common, are also opposite walls of the classroom. And the X's on your PDF that you can see on your screen now are the students. So here the activity is to get all the students out of their seats and to go and stand in a position that reflects their opinion quickly. So you can do this with all kinds of different topics. And um, this is just an example one, of course. But here, if we look at the student who's standing in the top left-hand corner of your screen, they obviously strongly agree with capital punishment, and they think that a miscarriage of justice rarely or never happens, probably. And so once you've got your student standing in the position that reflects their opinion, you can then ask them to justify to you, to each other, to the room in general, um, their position and then we can use this as a way to then later write about um, what we think on a topic or to make an argument for a topic. Moving on now to have a quick look at student needs. So one of the things that I think a lot of uh, schools are becoming aware of and a lot of teachers are aware of, oh, sorry we're talking about vocabulary, 
not needs, sorry. Um, so one of the things about academic English is that it demands a different vocabulary. So suddenly our students can go from general English where they're feeling like they're doing quite well to an academic world where suddenly a lot of their vocabulary is seen as being not academic enough. And this underpins all those skills of reading, writing, listening and speaking that they're going to have to do in the academic world. So this PDF is from the Academic Word List, which uh, is a piece of PhD research done by a lady, Kathy Coxhead, a few years ago. And she went through texts and found the most common words in academic texts and put them into 10 sublists, with sublist 1, which is on our screen here, um, being the one that's the most common. And then I found that these were useful for me as a teacher in the classroom because it gave me an idea of which words students needed to be able to know. And then this PDF that you can now see shows that basically we can use these um, words the same way that we use um, vocabulary in the general English classroom to play a variety of the games that we might play with vocab that I'm sure all teachers have a, a kind of a library of games that they like to play and just make the vocab a bit more academic. So um, that was a mix and match activity there. Now I'm going to talk about student needs. Sorry guys, um, I got mixed up there what I was doing. So here I just wanted to talk quickly about how for me as a teacher it's really important to build a profile of the class and to make it a written class profile and in that class profile to have um, individual student needs and to look at which of those needs do the students have in common. So here I've just given a quick example on the screen. We can see that Elliot has article problems, uh, that Selma is not very good at spelling, for example, and then we've also got things like what the students do for their work traditionally, what kind of vocabulary they might need to know for their future courses. And those are things that tend to differ across the classroom, depending on what level of EAP we're teaching and where we are, but quite often they're different. And so those things could perhaps be for self-directed learning, the things that are different, and for homework, and the things that are in common that we find that, you know, for example, often students here in Australia have trouble with articles because many of them are coming from languages with no articles. We might pick that as a common point there for this classroom that we're looking at. And so, although we can't please all the people all the time, we can try to. Okay, and now I'm going to talk about the element of surprise. So for me, surprise is one of the um, best things as a teacher, being uh, able to think outside the box and surprise my classroom. And I think in the EAP classroom, we can neglect this a little if we're not careful. We get bogged down in the amount of work that we have to do and that we have to get through with our students. And there's often a very demanding lot of course content that we might have there, that we might feel like there's no time to have fun or there's no time to surprise the students. And just like when you want to surprise a friend or um, someone in your family, you might find that a good surprise demands a little bit of um, planning, shall we say, and hiding things from people. So for me, um, sometimes I do things like I take all the, the chairs out of the room before the students arrive because I'm mean and I don't want them to sit down and I want to motivate them a bit to walk around and do some of those activities where they're all walking around. So I make sure that there's no chairs in the room. Or um, I might just uh, have an impromptu excursion which looks impromptu but which I've organized earlier that takes us on a tour of some of the faculties that the students will be part of within the university if we're linked to a campus. And obviously, you know, everyone has a different uh, idea of what surprise is and there's a lot of different things we can do there. But I think just like anything in an exciting kind of life. It's about not getting stuck in a rut with the students, not always doing the same thing on Monday, the same thing on Tuesday. Even if the curriculum demands it, we can uh, usually bend the rules a little bit and have a little bit of surprise in there and make sure that the learners don't get bored. So in summary, the things that I wanted to talk about today were that element of surprise, which is something that I love as a teacher and that when I do in the classroom, I find my students respond very well to movement which I think is sometimes lacking in our EAP classrooms in that we can get into the volume of learning that has to be done and forget to move around to share 
groups, to share ideas with other groups, to move the whole class to get us outside the room, doing something on campus, in the city, wherever we are. Um, the idea of academic vocabulary is an underpinner for all those major skills, the macro skills. Um, understanding deeply the students' needs, even if we only teach them two days a week, and working out what they are interested in, what their jobs are, what they're going on to do for further study, what they like to do in their free time, because we know as teachers that context is such an important element of learning a language. And last but not least, a clear purpose, so having an overall aim at the beginning of the lesson, something that we want to reach, that we want to achieve, and showing the students what it is and how we're going to achieve that with our objectives. So here are my references from what I've been talking about. And as usual, when I'm presenting, I've talked a bit too quickly, but maybe we have some time now at the end for some questions. Thanks, Richard. If you have any questions for Richard now, please type them into your text box. And while we wait for the questions, I'll just set up the next slide. So Richard, one of the questions from Tamsin is, what do you do on tours that you take your students on, tours of faculties you mentioned? Yeah, so normally if I'm doing that, I try to plan a little bit with the faculty. Obviously, it's not terribly polite in universities to go and turn up in someone's faculty without telling them that you're coming. So um, if I know a class quite well, I usually know at that point what kind of subjects they're going to be going on to do quite quickly. And then we can go and have a look in the faculty and just ask um, to have a quick interview perhaps with somebody who's going to be teaching because that's a nice thing to do. Students respond quite well to that. Or sometimes we just go and have a look around and see if we can have a chat to some of the students, some of the domestic students. It's nice to introduce your international students to domestic students. Um, and if we're very lucky, sometimes one place I worked up at La Trobe, we were lucky enough to be able to go in and have a look at lectures as well and see what the lectures were like, which was very good for the students because it gave them a very clear sense of what was coming, what they were going to be expected to be able to do in English. And although it might have scared them a bit, it was probably good. It made them work hard. Um, so Richard, there's one more question and then we'll have to move yeah. on to the next presentation. Okay. Um, this question is really about, are there any EAP resource books you could recommend for jazzing up EAP? Well, that's a good question. Mm. Well, well um, could you name your favorites, for example? I haven't been teaching EAP for a little while, so um, let me think. Uh, for jazzing up EAP classes, resources. Uh, you could have a think and come back at the end of the session as well. Could we do that? And My mind's gone blank. Yeah, just being no, that's fine. I'm sure there's lots and of good stuff And maybe this is a there. good question for the other presenters as well. So yes. everyone, that was Richard. Thank you very much, Richard. Let's now move on to Sarah and Lucy from Monash University English Language Center. Um, so, so Lucy and Sarah, I'll now be handing over the controls to you. Okay, thanks, Apana. in one second. Okay, there you go. So Sarah, are you able to move your mouse and access the slides? Sorry, Pana. Um, the slide that we're looking at is the presenter slide. Yep. You just click through. All right. There we go. Sorry. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay are we ready? Yep. Okay. 
Okay, so um, hi everybody, my name is Lucy and as Aparna mentioned, um, me and Sarah are both working currently with MUALC, the Monash University English Language Centre. Um, I've been here about seven years and before that I was working overseas in Southeast Asia in ESL teaching um, and I've taught sort of everything, EGP, kids, adults, EAP, IELTS, so a really broad range overseas and also with New York in terms of courses and levels. Hi everyone and welcome to the webinar. Uh, I've been teaching for about 15 years. Uh, 10 years as an English and Media secondary teacher and then moved into Ellicott's teaching about five years ago. Um, I found that in CELTA we learned quite a lot of creative techniques which were fabulous, but uh, in the daily routine of um, of the class, we can uh, they can sort of forget get forgotten about sometimes. So I was interested in um, you know revisiting these creative ideas and trying to incorporate them more into my daily teaching. I was also interested in um, tapping into some of the student interests and talents, as often I find you know their burning desire is to be a, a film director or something. Um, okay, so in creating this webinar, it was a great chance to reflect on our previous practice. Sorry, Aparna, is everyone still showing the screen? Because we've lost our PowerPoints here. Uh, have you? Hang on. Shall we continue on? Um, just a second. I think we've been disconnected. Oh. Hmm. I oh, know we're we're still online. Um, are you not able to click through? What's going on? No, we can't see our slides. We've gone back to the connected to go to webinar screen, Hannah. All right, just give me a second. Okay. How about now? No. Oh, oh yes. There we go. Back again. Okay. All right. Just one second. Technical issues. Are you able to click through now? Are you able to move the mouse? Yeah, the mouse moves. Yep. Just set up your slide again. Let me do that for you. Okay. Okay? Yep, looks good. Okay, so we'll continue on. Sorry about that. So um, I asked Sarah, you know, do, do we really think that we're getting the most that we can out of all of our students? And I replied, no, Lucy, I don't think we are. And that began our investigation into what we could be doing differently. Um, we started reading and realised that others definitely felt the same way. In particular, Adrian Underhill and Jim Scrivener, who have developed the demand high meme. Uh, Tan V. Ting from Auckland University has also looked into what benefits creativity might bring into the classroom. Recently, I was fortunate enough to spend some time at a Cambridge summer school. Uh, Jim Scrivener coordinated courses for EAL teachers and Adrian Underhill taught a course called From Sound to Storytelling which focused on developing the sounds of English and then moved on to a storytelling festival, which developed our storytelling skills as teachers. But their background was the, um, looking at getting more out of our students and how we can um, mine texts for more information and get students to not just extinguish answers from the students, but to really um, work with smaller amounts of text. So after having a bit of a look at the research that's around and what some people are talking about in this area, um, we've actually come to the conclusion that we do do quite a lot of good things in the classroom already. Sorry, our slide is not progressing. Um, uh, so 
what we need to do is actually not throw you know the proverbial baby out with the bathwater, but we need to look at what is being successful and then enhance the processes that we already have. Because really, if we talk to our colleagues in EAP, the EAP tasks that we do already ha do have elements of interactivity. They carefully plan the structures of the lessons so that students are challenged and involved and they do have opportunities to express themselves. Um, but I suppose the question for us was, uh, is there still something missing? Are we really doing everything that we can? Are there other opportunities where we can incorporate um, more and extend our students more. Good, yes. And we thought perhaps um, it was something to do with mining. Um, we're just waiting for the next slide to take over. Well, not exactly, but basically the idea that we can use the textbook material as a springboard into more creative activities. Instead of working individually, uh, trying to excruciatingly extract meaning from students, we would bring in the big guns, the excavators, and dig deeper. Uh, we would work collaborative, collaboratively and with the idea that we don't have to just cover material, but rather mine it for more. Um, so we can all recognise the benefits of textbooks and the need for them in a curriculum. However, use them more as springboards and still um, you know, cover the outcomes. However, look for quality and not necessarily quantity. Uh, one of the things that Adrian Underhill talks about in the demand high meme is to, as I said before, not extinguish answers quickly when students give them. So, for instance, you might take an answer and then ask other students to contribute and you know, exchange, um, expand and change that answer. You might ask another student to say, you know, uh, say it louder, say it softer, say it with an American accent, say it like you're angry, etc. And uh, try to just keep you know, a smaller amount of text um, going for longer rather than skimming over the surface of a large amount of text. There are a couple of risks involved with the mining also. We need to be wary that we don't, you know, sort of lose depth of understanding, um, that you, the students are absorbing enough and that the engagement with the material is not just at a superficial level, which I think is the quality not quantity idea reinforced there as well. Mm. Okay, so there's an image coming up of a, a baby looking into a mirror and uh, we're looking at the idea of Siri, here we go, uh, the idea of um, self-reflection. Um, part of the course I did was the importance of uncertainty. So, you know, Jim Scrivener, a very experienced teacher, got up and talked about how uncertainty still was every time he stepped into a classroom and that the nerves and the anxiety of, of you know, improvising during a lesson were... Um, were always there and actually really important things to maintain as it keeps us reflecting upon our practice. So Lucy, what does this image mean to you? Uh, I think this image really reminds me or talks to me about the importance of self-reflection um, as the teacher as well of, in, in thinking about what we do. So what exactly we need to ask ourselves, what exactly are we doing? Is it time to change it? Um, it's very easy to feel like we're doing a good job and therefore become stuck in the same kind of patterns of teaching and in the same kind of comfort zone because the things we're doing are, are successful so uh, we're not really extending ourselves or pushing ourselves because we tend to focus on other things. So one of the concepts that we discuss is multiple methods of reflection um, and also having this idea of self-reflection as part of your daily practice of teaching. Okay, so multiple methods of reflection mean that you don't just sit at your desk by yourself in your own little head and think about, oh, that went well, what we didn't went well, didn't go well, what could I improve? But actually um, engaging it other, in other ways with other people as well. So uh, you may want to keep, in terms of an individual process, you may want to keep a diary. Um, however, the idea with this is also that you are trying to connect with other people who do the same thing so that you can expand yourself and think about the things that other people are doing with us successful. So things like blogging, um, reading um, articles that are written by other people and journals, attending professional development, um, having just conversations with your colleagues, you know, what worked in your classroom, um, sharing ideas and sharing experiences. They're all different types of self-reflection because when we hear what other people are doing, it should be making us think about what we're also doing. And that should also be part of every day. When you think about your class every day and think about how you're going to run things, we need to do that. That's just part of our routine. 
What am I doing? What can I do better? Hmm. So um, this is really important because while we all do do good things in the classroom, there are also a lot of students. We have to ask the question, are we reaching all of the students all of the time or are some of the students flying under the radar? Ah, like that excellent song from 1988 by Underworld. Do you yes, mean? yes, ah. Sarah, that's mm. what I'm talking about. Uh, I'm sure many teachers experience this where you seem to be getting the same students always answering questions. It's the same students who dominate in speaking tasks, who dominate in assessments. Um, so we need to consider who is raising their hand in class. Is it just the same few students? Um, do we assume when three or four of the same students are raising their hand that everybody is understanding? Um, do we need to look for the people who are being silent and find ways to engage with them? So this is really from, for us where creativity can really come into play. Um, creative uh, activities and tasks really encourage students to engage with things on their own level. They can contribute their own ideas and it opens up a more expansive kind of uh, opportunity for them to participate. Yeah, we, and you may find that silent students actually, you know, particularly good at uh, expressing themselves with poetry or script writing or something that you know you wouldn't imagine necessarily um, in class because they're not the ones who are always raising their hands. Um, so, what exactly do we mean by creativity? Um, uh, is it having a great talent like playing the guitar, transforming your class into fluent speakers through some sort of magic tricks? Uh, we had a look on the internet and some sites suggested rapping was one way to perhaps engage students. Well, I don't know about you, but I would be particularly dreadful at all of these things and I create more embarrassment for both myself and the students than any productive learning. So no, while creativity may mean some of these things, some of the time uh, they don't necessarily mean that um, you need to have some you know, incredible talent. Uh, Underhill talked about the dark matter of um, teaching in one of his talks in um, Cambridge. And he said that a lot of what we do in ELT is improvisation, around 80% in fact he reckons. Both in jazz and acting, musicians and actors train themselves in improvisation. However, Improvisation in the classrooms tends to go largely unnoticed and we don't really talk about it, let alone study it. Um, you know, he suggested it might be good to find ways to improve um, how we improvise during teaching because we need to, you know, constantly respond to our students and uh, basically change the lesson plan um, almost sort of minute by minute as we, as we respond to their needs. <laughs> so, um, you know, perhaps we need to become more aware of how improvisation, how much improvisation goes on in our teaching practice. Uh, we need to learn to improvise, not unlike sort of, you know, a jazz performance or acting. Uh, moving away from set structures is also important and responding in a fresh way to students and not just bringing up the ready-made answers. And this obviously comes with, you know, practice and experience. So, um, we feel that it's more of a change in classroom culture that's important in terms of allowing creativity in, giving the students as well as the teachers also the time and the space to play with language, so script writing, poetry, role plays and stories are, are common ones that we have. Um, an interesting thing that we could align this with is, is that in very successful corporations like Google and 3M, Hewlett Packard, Apple, they actually have um, strategies where they allow their employees, say 15 to 20% of their time, their work time, uh, to work on their own uh, projects and to be creative and th th there's no real pressure on an outcome for that percentage of time. Um, the innovative workplaces like these recognise the importance of establishing both a creative physical and mental space for people to be in. Uh, I'd also like to pick on what, up on what Richard was talking about earlier. He's talking about altering the space, uh, the way you use space inside the classroom. And this is an element of creativity as well. Um, having students up and moving around really adds a, a dynamic element to the class. You know, rearranging the room, removing furniture, putting collaborative workstations um, around, around the room so they work together in groups in different places or if you have multiple whiteboards, having groups working at the same time on different boards. Um, also, as Richard was talking about, 
standing in a position across from one end to the other. This is this is not agree. This is very agree at the other end, and we stand in a line. Um, all of this gets people up and moving about, and focuses on the on, on the process of, of the interaction and gets people focusing on that rather than what their end goal is. So it's about the process, not necessarily the product. Um, surely also one of our jobs as educators is to prepare, prepare our students for the workplace. Um, while not every office will offer, the, oh, sorry, office will offer the kind of deal that Google will, uh, it's fair to say that one of the key skills employers require these days is the ability to think laterally and problem solve. So even though we're teaching language as opposed to perhaps content, other content, um, these are still important skills to you know, imbue our students with. Um, looking at PBL briefly, it's something that we use in secondary teaching and certainly prime, very effective in primary teaching. And you know, it's, it's centred around things like student-centred learning, um, learning being done in small groups. Facilitators or tutors guide the students rather than teaching. Uh, a problem forms the basis for the organised focus of the group and stimulates learning. Um, and the cognitive process, and new knowledge is obtained through self-directed learning, which we'll talk about a bit more uh, in a moment. So we also can consider why we ourselves became English teachers. Sarah, mm -hmm. why did you become an English teacher? Well, you loved teenagers and high schools. <laughs> Didn't want to leave? That's right. Well, look, I remember falling in love with English probably through poetry uh, when I listened to uh, and read Thomas Dillon's Under Milk Wood. Um, Dylan Thomas, sorry. Sometimes when I look at my own classroom though, I feel I'm sucking all the fun out of the language by constantly focusing on grammar and functional languages, language. So, you know, this is part of the reason I feel it's important to inject some creativity back in. So, do you... Sorry. <laughs> So we need to think about how we can get deeper with the language and the way that students are using it. Um, I suppose what we're suggesting is that it is possible for teachers to sort of look at maybe 10 to 20 percent of class time, you know, trying to be used more creatively with their students. Role plays are a really strong foundation for critical thinking skills. It also asks students to think outside of their own experience and, and um, usual roles of, in society and in life. Um, poetry awareness, uh, sort of phonological awareness. Um, if you have them collecting and analysing poetry, it, it helps them to look at rhythm and intonation. And script writing also gives them a chance to uh, express ideas uh, and to really shine in, in control of a language and, and have an exp to express themselves in that way. Uh, we might move beyond this because we've talked a bit about Scrivener and Underhill already and the, you know, the need to set the bar a little higher. Um, so we'll move on to look at the role of the teacher. The demand time meme that we've talked about already um, examines the role of the teacher in the classroom and, and there has been a move away from the idea of the teacher standing at the front of the room and dictating the shape of the lesson, asking students to answer and very much being the dictator of the, of the area and the space. But the demand high meme from Underhill really suggests that there's a need for the language classroom teacher to be really actively involved in fielding answers and asking students more questions and eliciting information and really pushing students to work a bit harder and advance their responses. So don't settle for just the easy answer. That's you know that's a good answer, Joe. But what else do we know about it? Push them a bit further and ask more. You know to push it just that across the line a bit harder. Yep. Exactly. And we also thought that choice is power. You know, is it possible that some of the problems we face in the classroom could arise from students feeling a lack of power? What if we were to give some of that power back by giving them more choice in the classroom? Um, you know, many students are doing accounting or business, but what they'd really love to be as a film director, can we incorporate some of those interests in? Um, so, uh, just very quickly, this is a, a project that um, I did with students a couple of years ago and it's about um, the point system and kind of fostering a sense of competition as well. So these are three examples of activities they could do for different point sets and they, they really, you know, they really enjoyed it and I think, you know, a lot of them went out to volunteer for 50 points for instance. Another group set up, um, went off to Ballarat for the weekend and, you know, wrote, um, did a photography essay and did some different things around that. So at least they, in this case, they had a bit of a sense of choice about what they were, you know, receiving um, their, you know, assessment for. Yeah, it's a really important point that often the goals of 
for our students are, are not movable. They're set down by curriculum, they're set down by courses and by, by writers. However, within that, we do have a bit of an ability or control over the process that we have. And in there, we can allow time for students to have some control as well. So there's a few take home ideas on the last page. You may know some of them already. Um, the top one theatre sports, there's two examples, space jump and slideshow. Um, I'll just talk about slideshow quickly. Slideshow basically is one student stands at the front and tells a story and the other student is acted it out. So you might start with a story about two people, you choose two that come at the front and as the first person saying, Joe and Mary were driving down the road in the car, the two students sit at the front and, and mime out what, what is being told to the, to the class. Um, with group work, you could look at uh, doing bigger projects like negotiated design work. In this type of activity, what you would do is set up uh, parameters for them. Uh, it's important here to, I suppose, mention the constraints. They're the things that really give the students some structure. So if we set up a, pro uh, a project similar, so something like uh, four students, you give them a piece of paper with an outline of a piece of land and you say, um, we want you to design a city. You can name it, you can uh, design where the areas fit, but it must have certain things like a police station, a high school, blah, blah, blah. But apart, So you set up some basic parameters they must achieve and apart from that, they're completely free to achieve the rest of the task according to what they feel is useful. Um, and that's what we meant by freedom and constraints and, and creativity. So, you know, setting up certain constraints because if you give them completely free reign, that's kind of equally difficult for them to, to think up ideas, but a certain number of constraints are necessary to um, you know, foster the creativity. And make them feel safe and secure in what they're doing. Absolutely. Okay, so we're speeding through this now, but we just wanted to say that not every lesson has to be or is going to be incredible. Ours certainly aren't. The aim of this presentation has been to suggest that we can afford to incorporate some creative ways of teaching and activities into our curricula um, without fearing, you know, that we're not meeting the outcomes. Um, that's to the last one. Look, here's our email addresses. If we'd love to set up a discussion with um, with any of you, if you'd like to contact us, and we could uh, perhaps chat more about it. Yes, but the cat in the hat sums it up perfectly. Thank you. <laughs> Lucy and Sarah, that was great. I'm especially glad that you mentioned the demand high in EAP idea. Um, we actually do have a session on that at the conference. Um, we've also got a few questions come through for you. Um, I've had a request for notes on the take-home ideas. Yep, would would that be something you could share with the attendees? At a, yeah, we you could put something together and send it through as well. Mm -hmm. Fantastic. Definitely. And again, the question about possible books and online resources that can help enliven EAP classes. Yeah, that one's really tricky. If you don't mind, I'll speak to that for a second. I've worked on curriculum review in our company um, for EGP EAP levels in the last two years. And uh, with, the really high, with the higher EAP levels, it really is a challenge to find something that's useful. I think um, that it's a very common problem when you look at EAP books, they're very dry, they're very um, function based, they're very skill based. So even the topics that you get into, some of them are, are not. Great. So I actually don't have a recommendation, unfortunately either. I just don't, I, after 12 months ago, I you know did a really big survey at bookstores and everything, and I really didn't come across anything that made me excited. Um, I tend to do a mix of just a range of different other EAP books. All EAP books have some activities that are really good, but I don't. I really don't believe there's one single EAP book out at the moment that is excellent. That that's the one that you would go to. I just don't feel that a publish there's a publisher that has something out there for that. I think it's still a matter of using multiple texts, EAP texts, to to pick out the best and you know. Gado gado, as we would say, just kind of shove it together from a range of sources. I don't know if anybody Thanks, else Lucy and that. Sarah. We might now move on to to Mark because we are running out of time. Um, so, Mark, if you'd yes. like to jump on. Okay. Hello, everybody. Uh, I'll wait for my slides. Oh, there, there is my slide. I'll just give a brief introduction. My name is Mark, and I I also teach at Monash. In fact, I'm in the same room as as the two lovely ladies. Um, and I'm, as you might notice from my accent, I'm an, an Irishman, but I've been in Australia for about eight years. I've been at Monash for about two years where I teach on English courses and a lot of it has an academic focus. 
and I spend a lot of my time in teacher development, helping teachers explore new ideas and try new things that you're teaching. So I think that's why I suggested the SQ3R method as something you might want to take into your reading classrooms. Now, when I did this with the conference in Melbourne, we actually turned it into a drinking game where every time I mentioned the letter R, you had a drink. So if you have got a cup of tea or a little nip of whiskey near you, it might be uh, something to make the presentation a little bit more fun. And also, as I'm Irish, where I come from, we don't say R, we say OR. So if you hear a few of those, I'm not using the preposition. That is how I say that letter. <laughs> okay, so one of the problems we have in, in academic reading classrooms is that students so commonly come up to us and they say, well, what am I supposed to read for? And we say to them, oh, you know, just get the main ideas and, and what do you think the text is about? What did you get out of it? And they, they don't really have many opinions, I'm jumping forward here, but I think one of the problems that, has, that this is from is that they've come from a background in general English where we just give them comprehension questions, they answer them, and they have very little interaction with the text on a personal basis. So I know we don't have a lot of time, so I'm briefly going to go through some of the problems I think we have in ESL reading. I think one of the most obvious ones is that a lot of the questions that you get in a reading, like a comprehension question, it's just based on vocabulary. So for example, today in one of my classes there was a question, and I think it was, what was it? Uh, was the restaurant, and there were three choices, was it expensive, was it cheap, or was it about right? And then when you mined the text and you found the answer, it was, oh, it was about par for this type of restaurant. Now, to get that answer right, you needed to know that about right and par are, sy are synonymous. It's not really a reading skill. At the end of the day, that's a vocabulary skill, and I think it's great to use texts uh, for teaching vocabulary, but essentially that's a vocabulary lesson. It's not a reading lesson. The second complaint I would have is that, and it's the classic complaint, is that we are just testing students' reading skills. We're not really teaching them how to read. You know, commonly we go into the class, we say, okay, read the text, okay, answer it. Did you get the right answer? No. Okay, you got the right answer. Very good. Let's move on. There's not a lot of actual unpacking of how do we read, what is reading, on a, even on a psycholinguistic basis, what is a, a reading process. So I don't think we do a lot of that. The third complaint I would have is that it just doesn't reflect real life reading. I don't know how often you do, but it's, I don't know many situations where I predict what the text is going to be about, look at the pictures, read it, and then answer some sort of questions. I don't think that is a real representation of how reading happens in the real world. And one of the main reasons is number four is that we tell learners what to read for. So we tell them, okay, find the answers to these questions. It doesn't really matter what you want to get out of the text. It doesn't mean you matter your interpretations of the text. The right and wrong answers are what we say they are when you read the text. Again, unrealistic and uh, not really a very interesting way to read. Fifth, and um, if, if no other reason to try something else, is that the common model of do some prediction, read the text, answer the questions, is just so ubiquitous in USL classrooms that I think learners just do it by rote. You know, I think they know. They, they just follow the script. Okay, we'll do this task. I'll answer this question. Number two is probably, the answer to number two is probably after the answers to number one. And number three is probably a little bit further on than that. You know, they can predict where the answers are and where they're going to happen. And when we have this shadow of IELTS over our classes where students read the text and they, they don't even know what it's about. They can answer the questions, but they have no real understanding of its meaning. Six, I don't think it really gives them any sort of passion for reading. I often hear uh, teachers complain, say, oh, these students, you know, they don't even read in their first language, so how am I supposed to get them to read this four-page article? And it's, maybe it's true that they don't read in their own language, but I think what's interesting about that is that, well, then you have a huge responsibility, a, a great responsibility to give them a passion for reading. And I don't think we're doing that. I think we're kind of breaking uh, reading for them. I think they go, oh, God, reading is just getting the right answers or getting the wrong answers. It's, it's a task to do. And we all know that that is not what reading should be about. So I would say to any teachers, you have a great responsibility if your students don't have a background in reading and to cultivate that, that passion for it. And of course, number seven, very prominent for academic world, is that it doesn't give any sort of autonomy or critical thinking. 
sometimes texts have critical thinking questions, but ultimately it's the questions we want them to answer. We don't really care about their interpretation of the text. So is there a solution? Well, I don't know if there's a solution, but I'm going to give you maybe something to try, and it's a method called SQ3, I'll try hard, R, R, uh, SQ3R. Now, I recommend you try it. I'm not saying it's going to solve everything, but it's definitely worth a go. So S stands for swoo. I'll go back. S stands for skin or survey. Q stands for question. R stands for, first R stands for read. Second one, recite. Third one, review. And I'll go through these one by one and maybe try and tell you how you can set this up in class and perform it so that hopefully it is successful. The first thing is skim, which we all know. We get the students to go th through the text very quickly, just getting the main idea, not taking too long, not having to understand every word, uh, and just getting a general gist of the question. Something we do in all our classes, uh, and there should be nothing new to our students. Now, once they've done that, once they've skimmed, get them to turn the page over. And we'll move to the next section which is, I think, really the crux of SQ3, or it's the question stage. Now, it's very careful how you set this up. So I'll go back. So once the students have read the text, put them in groups and say, OK, guys, I want you to write down four, five, maybe six questions that you want the text to answer. Yeah, so four or five questions that, having skimmed the text, having got the main idea, what are you curious about? What would you like to know? So for example, I just did an SQ3R yesterday with my academic class, and the topic was on how friendship rates are declining in the Western world compared to the Eastern world, how in America they have less close friends and more acquaintances. Uh, the students came, they got the general idea, and some of the questions that they asked in the groups was, why is it declining? Why is friendship declining in the States? Can it be stopped? Uh, is friendship different in different cultures? Uh, and, what, and then they've done, this, they've done SQ3 or a few times, so they came up with some great academic questions like, what is the evidence for this? Is there any hard data for that? So these are the kind of questions my students came up with. And this was the second or th third time for some of them having done SQ3 or so. Already they were asking these sort of deep level questions uh, going into the text. So, I wanna, so that's really important that you say to the students, OK, you write the questions, but the first tip I would give you is make sure students know they should not expect all their questions to be answered. So that, that is, that's I think where some people kind of go wrong, the students can get frustrated. They write down these questions and they can't find any answers and they feel like they're not performing the task correctly. But I reassure students very early on, if you ask five questions, you get one or two answers, that's quite good, that's successful. So it's very important that you uh, ensure they do that. It's also important that you tell them the task is not to write questions for information you remember from the text. So for example, yesterday, one of the facts was 25% of Americans don't have any close friends. The wrong thing to do there would be for the student to turn it over and write down what percentage of Americans don't have close friends. That's not the idea of the activity. The idea of the activity is to be curious about the text and to read it again with some real interest. Now, of course, the first time or second time when you set this up, students may need some guidance. So I would recommend you put them into groups, they brainstorm some questions, and then elicit some of those questions and put them up on the whiteboard and unpack them as a class. Say, okay, is this a good question? Do we think this text will answer that question? Why do we like that question? Can we, can we reframe it a little bit? So this is a great way for them to actually start thinking, they're already starting critically at this stage about how they form their questions. Okay, so once they've done their questions, we go to the next stage, which is for them to turn back over the text and to read that text until they find answers to their questions. Now, this is a, a really fascinating section if it goes well. So what often happens is students get half answers to their questions. So they don't get a full answer to their question, or they think they've got an answer, but they're not exactly sure. So you can, at this stage, I go around and I monitor and I say, OK, did you get an answer to your question? Student A says, yeah, yeah, yeah. And student A says, no, it doesn't really answer the question. And just them having that conversation of, is our question answered or is it not, 
really means they're getting into the text on a deeper level. They're really, really negotiating meaning and getting inside the text and starting to unpack the meaning very, very deeply. So the, the learners are interrogating the text, and I like the verb interrogate. They're really, really questioning it. It's not questioning them. They're questioning it to get answers to their questions. And when you walk around and then, I would say, maybe have a, a whole class feedback and say, OK, whoops, did you, did you get answers to your questions? Some of the conversations that come out of that are, are really, really interesting. Because what we actually find is that some questions are half answered, and that's OK. Because when we do our general comprehension questions in class, there's a right or a wrong answer. But I don't think that's very realistic. You know, the world is nuanced. It's black and white. Did the text answer your question? Well, it kind of did. Then we start getting into uh, conversations of inference and implied meaning and knowledge you bring into the text. And all these kind of things are really the academic skills we want to be getting our students to think about and develop. So if you set up this task, I think this section, when, they, when you, as a teacher, it's really important that you handle this section carefully, that you, you, know, you welcome all the information from the students and that you negotiate the meaning and realize that there, there is actually interpretation of text. Student A and student B might have a different interpretation of the text because of what they bring in, and that's okay, but that's good. And then we really start getting into critical thinking of how texts can be understood. Okay, so the next section, once they've read it, say, okay, guys, that's great. What I want you to do now is maybe you get someone from group A and put them with someone from group B and group C. And what they do is they recite what they've learned or they recite what they've, what they've come across. So that would just take the form of, okay, so I'm student A and I'm talking to my group, say, in our group, we asked the question, why is friendship going down in the United States? And as a group, we decided that the text kind of says it's going down because of social media. Although it doesn't actually say that, it talks about social media, so we think that's what, what it's saying. And those are the kind of answers students are saying in class. You start to hear them saying, uh, he doesn't say it, but we think it's clear from the text, or that's how I interpret it. You know. And, these are the kind of things we want to hear students saying. And very early in the SQ3R method, you start to hear students talking about interpretation. That's what I got from the text. They start to say, that's what I inferred from the text, which is, you know, it's what we want to hear in academic classes. So once they recite that to each other, what we're hoping is that there's a deeper understanding, that they're, once they articulate it, they're getting a stronger meaning of the text. And as we all know, you think you understand something, and then you go to explain it, and then it doesn't quite come out. Uh, so I'd recommend anyone who's listening to this webinar, maybe this afternoon or tomorrow, within the next 24 hours, maybe explain SQ3R to one of your colleagues or a friend, and that will deepen your knowledge of it, and that we can, you, can, you can really uh, solidify its understanding in your minds. And then the final section, which uh, is something I really enjoy doing. I think this really shows reading in its in its full potential, what reading can really do. And when re reading is done correctly, this is what it does. I get them to do three things. I say, OK, read the text. Just write down, what did you already know? So you knew this already and had it confirmed. So, oh, I already knew that friendship was going down in the United States. I already knew that. Or I already knew Americans have more friends than Chinese people. The average American has more friends than the average Chinese person. I already knew that. What did they learn? Oh, I learned that social media is having a massive influence. Or I learned that. Uh, 30% men have more close friends than females or something like that. So something I didn't know. And then the most interesting thing I get to do is, okay, having read that text, now what would you like to know? What would you like to find out on that topic? Write down three or four questions that have sparked your interest, things that you want to know. And then for homework, go, look them up on the internet, go to the library, see if you can find answers to these questions. And this way then, when we go through the process of reading, that reading is a process where you come in with beliefs and you come out with questions. And that reading is a process of moving forward and learning things and developing as individuals. Because I think, you know, reading is a quest for knowledge. And, and I like to say to my students, when you, when you pick up a text, you should say to yourself, will this make me a better person in, in a certain way? Will it make me understand the world in a better way? Not just, can I get 9 out of 10 in the text? Can I get Ben 5.5 and I? Reading is so much more than that. And I think, like I said before, teachers are kind of to blame in this way because ESL 
tends to treat, to, uh, treat texts as linguistic objects, Talos texts as linguistic objects. It is merely a device for introducing some grammar, uh, testing comprehension, or going through some lexis. And we very rarely treat texts as vehicles for information. But that's what they are. That's what texts are. In the real world, texts are written for an audience to pass on information. I think it's time in classes that we do a lot more of that and we treat texts for what they are. Okay. So, just going again. Well, next slide is not coming. Oh, there it is. So just to tell you again, skim. Students skim the text to get the main idea to kind of raise their scheme out about the text. Then in groups or individually after a while, get them to write down questions that they want the text answered. They're curious about what do they think it will answer. They might not find all those answers, but that's okay. They read the text carefully, trying to find answers to the questions. Maybe they don't follow a full answer, but they're getting approximations of the answer, and they're really interrogating the text for meaning. Then they split up. They talk to someone who had different questions, and they recite what they learned. So, okay, I had this question, and I think this is the answer. And then their partner says, well, I read it, and this is what we think is the answer. So they're deepening their understanding and hopefully having a conversation in and around critical thinking. And finally, a review. They reflect on the text. Okay, what did I already know and had confirmed? What did I learn? And what do I want to know? What, what else can I learn on this topic beyond this text? So moving forward and seeing text as, as a gateway to more information. Doing this kind of thing, you would hope then that students would look at reading in a more positive light and say, okay, today's reading really made me think about the topic. That's really great. So you really want students to say, oh, I, I want to find out more about this. I really want to look this up. Because really when they go to university, that's what they need to do. So I'm going to finish by giving you just some quick tips to make this a success. Because I know a lot of teachers have tried this. Some people have had a lot of success. Some people have said it's been quite difficult and, and they haven't fully got it over. So some of the tips I would give on my final slide when it comes up is don't expect success the first time. You know, it, it might not work. Uh, down there. So don't, don't expect everything to work perfectly. It's not always expected for things to go as you want them. There we go. Like now. <laughs> uh, the second one is be clear in your instruction. I would say be very careful how you roll out the idea. Don't just come in and blather, okay, we're going to do SQ3 or blah, 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 blah. blah. Here's how do it. Really go do the S stage and explain it. Do the Q stage and explain it do the first or and explain it. Roll it out carefully. I would say the first time you do it, give yourself a good two-hour session to get through it carefully. And be, care be patient. Learners need training in a new method. They're not just going to pick it up and run with it. Just because you think you've got your head around it doesn't mean they've got their head around it. So be very patient what they do and reassure them. You know, say to them, listen, especially when if you have not the answer to the question, that's okay, that's expected, that's normal. Or if they haven't written great questions, say, okay, that's okay, that's normal. Reassure them, it's different, it's new. If you've got some anxiety around it, that's, that's perfectly okay. And I would say it's very important that you tell them why you're doing SQ3R. Tell them why you are not doing comprehension questions today, that you're gonna try something different, and explain why do I get you to skim. And for example, today, or yesterday when I did it, I said, okay, why do I get you to recite? They had, I got them to discuss that for two or three minutes. And they really didn't know, and I think so often in our classes, we get students to do things and they don't really know why, why we get them to do it. I mean, go into class tomorrow, get your students to skim, stop them and say, okay, why, did I, why, do I, why do we ask you to skim in class? And see if they can actually tell you why. I, I find a lot of times they don't know why we get them to do things. And the final two ones are, and this is, I can't stress how important this is, believe in yourself and the method. If you kind of go in willy-nilly and you're not really confident about, about it happening and say, oh, I'm going to try something today, guys, it might work. Or if they say, oh, teacher's not working and you start to flounder, they're going to lose faith in the method. They're going to say, oh, this teacher doesn't know what they're doing. So go in there, pretend you've been doing it all your life, believe in the method, be confident about it, make them think you've done it numerous times, and they'll go with you. You know, Don't be afraid to hypnotize them into doing it. And of course, adapt to your context. Maybe you don't do all, you might not do the review stage. You might split it up over a number of weeks. You might add in some sections. Uh, there is an SQ4 or. There is an SQ10 or. I'm not sure what all the or stand for, but there is an SQ4 or out there if you want to Google it. So my final advice is 
give it a go. If it, if it doesn't work, I would say maybe try it another time and think about what, how you can make it work. But ultimately, think about reading in the classroom. Think about what you're doing now and really what's happening in a reading classroom regarding teaching the skill of reading. Uh, and if you have any questions, please feel free to give me an email, which I believe will come up in a second on the slide. And that's me. Mark, thank, thank you, you so much for that. I think it started a lot of people thinking. I've now got requests for notes from you, um, Sarah and Lucy, and Richard as well. So if this is something you would like to put up, the notes to your actual slides, that would be great. Um, if you could send that to me and I could share that with the audience. Also, sure. for the audience, just a reminder that these slides will be available on the English Australia webinar section uh, for you to look at, along with the notes from the presenters today. We don't need to stop this conversation. Well, we have to stop the webinar now because we're running out of time. But you can continue these conversations with your presenters. Here's the email addresses for everyone who presented today and myself if I can help you with anything. Now, if there are no other questions for Mark, I'll just have a quick look. So, Mark, are there any favorite books you would rec recommend? Um, it's interesting with academic English. I think it's got a bit of a bad rep for books. I know here at our bridging course we use the Cambridge Academic English, and I've, I've used that sometimes. And I like where that's going. It's, it's much more realistic about it. So I think it's mm. the Cam Cambridge Academic English. I think it's it's getting closer to where we want to be, but I think it's the challenge for everyone. I think more so than ever, the teacher really needs to bring the materials to light uh, in the EAP world, in the academic English, and I think it's really, it's time to stop hiding behind materials. I don't think you can do that in academic English. I think you really need to engage with the ideas and the learners. If it is up to the teachers, I've now got a question saying what kind of topics can teachers look into? Um, for intermediate and upper intermediate level students at EAP. Is that for me or for everyone? Yeah, that's just for everybody, if anybody wants to have a go at that. Um, so this is Lucy again, sorry. So with the, um, just the writing that we did last year, the curriculum development stuff, with the mid-level EAP courses, because a lot of the students that we have are still heading towards an IELTS score, we um, tend to encourage teachers to stick around uh, general social topics. Uh, the main thing is that they're things that you, you want to be able to find fairly easily, locate fairly easily, and that, that you can find at a pitch that works for the level as well. Uh, in my personal opinion, I think you can do pretty much any topic with any level. It's more about finding the pitch that's right, finding materials that they're able to deal with and engage with. So obviously lower levels and higher levels, you're looking at different levels of complexities with the articles or the listings that you find. But generally students are working towards IELTS, so in support of that we tend to stick along fairly similar broad social, nothing too controversial, things that they can see happening around them. So real life applications, things that they can connect with, I think is important. Fantastic. Yeah. Thanks for that, Lucy. Sorry, Mark, were you going to add something? Yeah, and I'd just like to add, so don't always feel bound by the academic topic because if you're teaching critical thinking, I mean, pick up a gossip magazine. You know, who who is the author here? What is their purpose in getting this across? And then unpack what is truth and what is fact and what is opinion. And then once you, I think, establish that maybe in a more fun context, so it could be a gossip magazine, you could be reading about Kim Kardashian, and once we establish, okay, the author wants this to happen, uh, the audience is this, this, this is fact, this is opinion, that introduces these concepts, and then we can transfer those to more academic texts. So, you know, it's kind of a scaffolding towards the more drier texts, but you can still use fun text to explore these skills. Thank you very much, Mark. I think that's all we have time for now. But as I said, please do continue this conversation via email um, and send us your questions. I'd like to thank all our presenters today. That was a fantastic session, and it has given us a lot to think about. So Mark, thank you. Lucy and Sarah, thank you. And thank you, Richard, as well. Thanks, Thanks That was the end of the webinar. Um, thanks, everyone, for coming. <laughs>